Wrestling is arguably one of the first games we humans ever played, from the prehistoric evidence found in cave drawings in France to the martial arts of ancient Greece and beyond. Of course, in those days, wrestling didn't involve storylines or barbed wire or titantrons or macho men. The best of the best, and to heal with the rest, yeah. Nowadays, the most popular form of wrestling is entertainment first. Though there's no doubting the rise of MMA, the pro wrestling scene has a gigantic audience by comparison. Shows play out like soap operas, with characters going through long story arcs littered with twists, turns, and tables. What was once the violent preserve of the ultra manly is now a family friendly, slickly produced and heavily merchandised multi-million dollar industry. And where there's merchandise, there are video games. But with so many different characters, feuds, federations and steel chair headshots, it's easy to get lost backstage when it comes to wrestling games. So we've oiled up and done the research to give you an easy escape from Mount Stupid. And before anyone asks how many Irish whip jokes are going to be in this week's episode, I'll tell you. One. There. Poetically enough, the wrestling genre started mere months after a certain Vince McMahon founded what's now known as the WWE. In 1983, The Big Pro Wrestling was released on Japanese arcades by Tecmo Japan of Double Dragon fame and was later ported to home consoles in the West under the name Tag Team Wrestling. You played in single or tag team combat and had to scroll through a menu of moves every time you grappled an opponent. There were two teams, the Ricky Fighters and the Strong Bads, the inspiration behind Homestar Runner's foul mouth luchador. You start sawing a hole in the floor and I'll stomp on this casserole. The original arcade version also had sound effects that sounded less like professional athletes and more like two grown men arguing with their mouths full. <laughs> Then in 1986 came Pro Wrestling, a Nintendo game most remembered for its A Winner Is You victory screen. The game charted your rise through the Video Wrestling Association to earn a title shot against King Slender or Giant Panther and become the WVA champion. Pro Wrestling was notable for having a referee who would run over to the wrestler before laying down and starting the three count, as opposed to the ghoulish teleporting referees in other titles of that era. It introduced a more tactical element to the game, pin too far away from the ref and your opponent might kick out before the end of the count. Slowly but surely, wrestling games were starting to reflect the atmosphere and pacing of their real life counterparts. <laughs> These early titles helped establish one of the most lucrative genres, but like most sports games of the time, they suffered by not having real-life superstars fans recognized from their TV sets. Sega gave it a go with the oddly titled Apu, which contained knockoffs of Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant and Abdullah the Butcher. Sadly, it really was a bit of Apu, but a year later the WWF would step into the ring and change the genre forever. The World Wrestling Federation, as it was known then, saw its first game released in the arcade in 1989. WWF superstars gave wrestling fans the chance to step into the spandex shorts of their favourite WWF superstars. That same year, the franchise came to home consoles in the form of WWF WrestleMania for Nintendo. It featured six real superstars and marked the beginning of the company's 12-year relationship with Acclaim. This is when wrestling games really began to take off. With licensed titles now available for home systems, the battle to control the video game market would quickly become as fierce as the weekly war for TV ratings. WCW burst onto the scene with their creatively titled WCW Wrestling, which was essentially a port of the Japanese game Superstar Pro Wrestling. Fans were neither fooled nor impressed by the game, which set the tone for WCW games for the better part of a decade, as they continued to trail behind the WWF in quality and popularity. The WWF continued to innovate with their arcade title WWF WrestleFest, released in 1991. It's still fondly remembered today thanks to its heavily stylized graphics, four player mode and a range of moves programmed to each button combination that would change based on how much energy your opponent had left. It even had a super cool winners don't use drugs screen at the start. Aren't steroids drugs? If you fancy giving it a go on the go, it's recently been ported to iDevices with a bunch of new characters. Featuring the biggest WWE superstars and legends. WrestleFest's over-the-top graphical style was cool, but paled in comparison to Saturday Night Slam Masters, an arcade title from Capcom that also made its way onto the Super Nintendo and Genesis. 
Released in Japan with the most roidtastic name ever, Muscle Bomber The Body Explosion, it's basically Street Fighter Does Wrestling. The popularity of wrestling games in Japan is often forgotten, and so too is the awesome Fire Pro Wrestling series that's been running there since 1989. What many would fob off as an isometric beat-em-up is actually one of the finest tuned wrestling games around. No button mashing here, you need expert timing to beat your opponent. Japanese developer Spike took over the series in 2000, they're also responsible for the King of Colosseum series. Also worth a mention is insane FMV wrestling game, All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling, Queen of Queens. And also Giant Grand 2000 based around All Japan Pro Wrestling, which GameSpot News editor Brendan Sinclair still reckons is the best wrestling game ever made. And while we're on the subject of obscure but insanely popular wrestling games, how about a mention for the Extreme Warfare series, a wrestling management text simulator created by British programmer Adam Ryland. While the WWF has at points experimented with obscurity of their own, such as the baffling collectible card style game WWF with Authority, wrestling games had pretty much established their release model. Large innovation followed by baby steps while they prepared for the next leap forward. So it was and so it still is today. Talking of leaps forward, Super WrestleMania saw the WWF make its debut on the Super Nintendo in 92, introducing a tug-of-war grappling system that would endure for the next few games. It was pretty decent, but the WWF wouldn't really prove its mettle on the SNES until the following year. The WCW at this point was nowhere to be seen. The Federation's first and in fact only title on the Super Nintendo wouldn't emerge until WCW Super Brawl came out in 1994. It blew. And not in that endearing, clearing dust out of a cartridge way. <sighs> it didn't help that the same year Acclaim published WWF Raw, which was a real leap forward for the series. Characters got diverse movesets with signature specials, more than one type of suplex, and wrestlers with varying stats that actually impacted on the gameplay. Fast forward to 1997 and it wasn't just Hollywood Hogan who was trying to create a new world order. THQ got their hands on the WCW brand and brought that back into contention. WCW vs NWO World Tour was a THQ game developed for the N64. Its new grappling system put previous efforts to shame and it set a new quality bar for wrestling games. For the first time, well, ever, WCW had won up on the WWF as both Warzone and In Your House failed to impress. Oh. Mm. Designing the box art in Microsoft Paint couldn't have helped. THQ were clearly a force to be reckoned with and would continue to perform well for the WCW for the next few years, with Nitro coming out in 98, followed by Thunder in 99. This time, the torture is gonna last longer on the Hollywood Walk of Shame. That same year, Claim released WWF Attitude, which used Warzone's engine. It had an expanded create a character mode, create a pay-per-view, and some of the most vague commentary to ever grace a video game. More importantly, it was the first game to ever have a career mode, something of a staple of the series ever since. You bony jabroni! Both franchises were doing well, but in a battle there can only really be one champion, and what's wrestling without a good old-fashioned double cross? After Attitude, the WWF severed ties with Acclaim and incredibly threw in their lot with WCW game makers THQ. Acclaim used the Attitude engine to make some games for Extreme Championship Wrestling, while WCW signed the deal with Electronic Arts. Well, we're underway with this matchup! The result was WCW Mayhem, released on the N64 and PlayStation in 1999. Fresh to the genre, EA didn't hold back with their debut, adding every pay-per-view and TV show on the WCW card, as well as being the first ever wrestling game to include backstage areas. Their attempts to show wrestling as a drama as well as a sport would have gone further if it hadn't been for time restraints. Their plans to create the first story-based wrestling game were unfortunately scrapped. He was really working him in the corner! THQ, meanwhile, made its WWF debut with WrestleMania 2000, which boasted a nice assortment of characters, modes and weapons, along with a comprehensive character creator mode, which allowed you to handpick your moves for every single scenario. A follow-up to WrestleMania 2000, WWF No Mercy, arrived that same year, adding their own backstage shenanigans and smoother character animations. Sadly, it also shipped with a bug that deleted all your save data every time you turned it off. Nowadays, a simple post-release patch would do the job, but back then, THQ were forced to replace the faulty cartridges for free. 
Unfortunately, blood was removed from the later versions, but just the colour. They didn't remove the animation, so when a wrestler got busted open, he'd stumble around and become instantly amazed by how sweaty his forehead was. While No Mercy was a popular title on the N64, it was a fairly modest improvement on what THQ had served up the year previous. The PlayStation, meanwhile, was just about to become the stage on which wrestling games would change forever. SmackDown burst its way onto Sony's little grey machine in the spring of 2000, just in time to stop thousands of us from leaving the house all summer. SmackDown boasted an incredible season mode that charted your rise through the ranks of the WWF. In pre-season, you were able to forge friendships or rivalries that were then locked into the game, so real feuds could develop as you were interrupted or assisted during matches. The game was considerably more polished than anything wrestling fans had ever played before. For one thing, the camera was much more energetic, bringing the game a bit closer to its TV counterpart. Characters were more detailed, and you could take the fight through the expansive backstage area, adding a sense of freedom rarely brought to wrestling games in the past. It also had the most wonderfully unintelligible intro song. Come on everybody, sing along! SmackDown changed the face of wrestling games forever, and it will prove to be WWF's finishing move in their long bout with the WCW. Later on that year, EA pooped out WCW Backstage Assault, which removed the ring entirely and had all the action placed behind the scenes. Presumably because the soon-to-be bankrupt WCW had probably sold all their rings. This, the last WCW game ever released, sold no more than 200,000 copies. The WWF stripped them of a selection of trademarks and contracts, and on March 26, 2001, the WCW was dead. And two weeks later, the ECW was gone too. As we've seen in many genres, competition helps to drive innovation, and with their biggest competitors dead and buried, the WWF fell into a pattern of iteration, arguably both on consoles and in the ring. SmackDown saw several sequels, including Know Your Role and Here Comes the Pain, the first game to show the newly branded WWE logo after the group lost their copyright battle with the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Come on, get up! Ukes, the developers of the lion's share of modern wrestling games, use the engine from Here Comes the Pain to create Rumble Roses, a game about women punching the living daylights out of each other, often in mud. There was also a dedicated mode where you could watch two computer-controlled wrestlers fight it out, leaving your hands free to do whatever else you wanted, really. Like shaking up a can of soup, for instance. <clears throat> Rumble Roses XX came out on the 360 in 2006, but Honestly, I don't like talking about this series too much. It, it's just a few baby steps away from that game we talked about a few weeks ago. Battle Raper 2, the game If you widen the wrestling game net a bit further, you come across games like Def Jam Fight for New York, which let you beat the crap out of rappers with other rappers. The Simpsons Wrestling, which was pretty crap if I'm honest. And special mention must go to the Backyard Wrestling series, which went on to sell half a million copies despite being rubbish. Presumably because it was the only game where you could kick seven shades of snot out of Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope from the Insane Clown Posse. Yeah! Andrew WK and Tara Patrick were in the sequel, which sold 300,000 copies despite being critically panned. 2004 saw the start of one of WWE games' most enduring franchises, SmackDown vs Raw. Unfortunately, they fell into the Madden pattern of being glorified roster updates with the odd gameplay tweak. 06 added Test of Strength and Stare Downs. 2007 saw the series come to Xbox 360 for the first time and added analog grappling, online play and a host of new game modes. In 2008, it arrived on the PlayStation 3 and added Money in the Bank, King of the Ring and ECW Hardcore modes. 2009 put a focus on tag teams, had Road to WrestleMania mode and was bloody awful. 2010 wasn't much better and sadly it was the final game to include the now discontinued ECW brand. And last year, 2011 introduced Universe mode and a new physics engine which saw weapons break apart during use. Again, it wasn't great. Though I'm being down on a lot of these modern wrestling games, some of the most enjoyable game nights I've had with my mates have been spent playing them. Away from the single player experience, the technical and variety issues that these games suffer from don't really seem to matter so much. 
Last year we were also treated to WWE All-Stars, a simplified old versus new arcade throwback with classic characters and fun well-balanced over-the-top action. A genuinely great game for anyone who's ever been interested in wrestling and proof that there's life in the genre yet. Recent years have seen MMA games evolve as popularity in the sport is exploding. THQ have attempted to combat this with the rebranded WWE 12 with its new animation system, easier controls and TV style presentation. Oh, you do not get up from that. And while it didn't set Metacritic on fire, it certainly represents a step in the right direction. Don't you agree, Skyrim version of Macho Man? Yeah! But what do you guys think? What's your favorite wrestling game? Do you still watch the TV shows? And what do you think the future of the wrestling game genre is? Please leave your thoughts in the comment box below, or feel free to contact and heckle me directly on the Twitterverse. Yeah! Thanks for watching another episode of Escape from Men Stupid. Remember, you can watch previous episodes from last season or last week's episode about Half-Life by clicking on the name of the show above this video now. You can also subscribe to the show there too, and then you'll get an update when we put up the next video, which is about this.